Good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to another edition of Cosmos from Your Couch. I'm so excited that you're here joining us. My name is Kara Manovich. I'm Events and Outreach Officer here at the Dunlap Institute at the University of Toronto. I'm super excited about this talk this evening. We have uh, Vincent McKay, who is a member of the Department of Physics here at the University of Toronto. He's a PhD candidate. He's going to give an amazing talk on radio astronomy. Um, I cheated a bit. I saw a little preview of it yesterday and it just blew me away. So I think you're uh, in for a real treat. So without further ado, I do not want to take up any time. Let's get right to the, the good stuff this evening. And uh, please welcome uh, Vincent McKay. Thank you and enjoy. Hi, hello. Thank you for tuning in. And thank you, Kara, for the introduction. Um, my name is Vincent McKay. I, um, I'm a PhD candidate in the Department of Physics uh, at the University of Toronto. We do have a Department of um, Astronomy uh, the, here at the university, uh, but I am a, a physicist. And I, I point that out because radio astronomy, like many branches of, of astronomy, attract people from many different fields. So my background is in mathematics and physics, um, but there are a lot of people uh, who work on my team who have a background in astronomy, um, background in math, also a background in electrical engineering, computer science, mechanical engineering, software engineering, so it really, um, even make mechanical engineering, so it really attracts people from all over the place. Um, and I think that's one of the things that makes radio astronomy interesting. So the talk um, is called Peeking into the Invisible Universe of Radio Astronomy. And let's go. So here is a big picture of um, the galaxy Hercules A. A galaxy, for those who don't know, is a collection of stars. Inly. And when I say a collection, I really mean a huge lot of them. Um, above a billion, uh, even above 10, bil 10 billion. Sometimes we talk about a whole, the order of 100 billion stars in a single galaxy. And not only stars, but also planets, um, black holes, uh, clouds of gas. Uh, we also have um, remnants of old stars that have exploded. So if you think as... Um, of stars as a people, a galaxy is like a city. It has its compact and it has a bunch of different stuff in it. And this is a picture you might uh, see if you go on Google image and you type Hercules A. Well, you might not uh, see this picture exactly. Sometimes what you might see is that picture. That picture here with the big pink blobs. So now the question is, wait, these are two pictures of the same thing, but they are really different. Um, the, the first thought that you might have by looking at this second picture is, okay, maybe something enormous exploded in the galaxy or something appeared in front of the camera or um, the, two, the two pictures basically were taken at different times. But no, these two pictures could have been taken exactly at the same time. Why is it that one of them shows these big pink blobs and one of them just shows this galaxy in the center, which just looks like a brighter star. Well, to answer this question, I'm going to have to introduce you to radio astronomy. And we're going to start with a detour um, that uh, starts with a little thought experiment. So let's do this thought experiment. First, what are the colors of the rainbow? Here they are. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. The thought experiment is to think, can you imagine a color that is not uh, one of the colors of the rainbow? So are there more colors? And when I say, are there more colors, I'm not talking about dark red or, or brown or navy blue, um, because these are all combinations of the colors of the rainbow. I'm really talking about, can you imagine a color that you've never seen? This is really the kind of questions that you ask with your friends, maybe late at night when you're pondering philosophical thoughts. So are there, can, can I imagine a color that my eyes have never seen? Uh, this is a hard question. Uh, I think if we wait until someone gets an answer, a uh, clear answer, you know, we're gonna wait a long time. So I'm gonna give you a hint. The hint is that light is an electromagnetic wave. Let's break that down. Electromagnetic. 
This word might sound intimidating, but what it means is that light interacts with charged particles. Some examples of charged particles are electrons, protons, ions, um, etc. And why do we care that light is an electromagnetic wave? Well, we care because it means that light is easy to detect because most of our devices uh, work with some form of electricity. Uh, your, your phone camera, um, or old camera, even old cameras that had film, uh, it's electrical reactions that happen in the, in the film. Um, most of our devices work on electricity, which makes life easy to detect. But for the question at hand of are there more uh, colors than the colors of the rainbow, it's the second part that we care about, is the wave part. So light is a wave. And as such, it has a wavelength. The wavelength is a property that every wave has. And here on this picture, I show you uh, what it is, is basically the distance between two peaks. So here I chose two peaks uh, at the bottom. I could have chosen two peaks at the top. Any two peaks, the distance is called the wavelength. And every wave has a wavelength. Now, if we go back to light and we present these little specks of light as waves, what do what they look like? Well, here they are. And what you notice is that they all have different wavelengths. In fact, the only thing that really distinguishes colors from one another are their wavelengths. The redness of the color red and the greenness of the color green or the yellowness of the color yellow are all things that our brain uh, do when they interpret these wavelengths. But really, um, the only difference between the colors are their wavelengths. In fact, if tomorrow all of us became colorblind and saw the world in black and white, as long as we had a machine that was able to measure the wavelength of the, these little specks of light, we could still be able to tell whether an object is red or blue or yellow. Now, under that angle, if we try to ask the question, are there more colors than these seven colors? Well, you can think, what if the wavelength was greater? Or what if it was smaller? Do these two colors exist? Um, what do they look like? Well, not only they, they exist, but the seven colors of the rainbow are only a small part of all the colors that exist. So here I represented them on this um, sort of wiggly line, which represent the longer wavelengths on the left and the shorter wavelengths on the right. And the colors of the rainbow are the ones we can see with our eyes. So we call them the visible light. All the rest is invisible. Now, I put the shorter wavelengths on the right because light with shorter wavelengths carries more energy. So higher energy at shorter wavelengths. So what has higher energy than uh, visible light? Then the, the color with the most energy is the color violet. So more energy than the color violet is ultraviolet. So ultraviolet is, if you will, an invisible color. It's uh, one that is uh, produced by the sun. And since it has more energy than the visible light, this is the reason why we, we uh, protect ourselves from ultraviolet. Even more energy than ultraviolet are x-rays. X-rays, uh, as you know, we use them to uh, look at our skeleton or, or to uh, take x-rays of our, of our teeth when we go to the dentist. And we also protect ourselves from x-rays when we, we do x-rays because they, are, they have so high energy. And even higher energy are gamma rays. Uh, gamma rays uh, can be found when there is a nuclear fission. Nuclear reactions produce these very high energy, energetic specks of light. Uh, and also we want to protect ourselves from gamma rays. And what if we went on the other side? Lower, lower energy at longer wavelengths. Well, what has less energy than the color red? It's infrared. Uh, you might be familiar with infrared because this is a technology that many remote control use, many remote controls use to communicate with television sets. So sometimes if you hold a remote control and you, you click on volume up, volume down, it works. But the little bulb, bulb at the end of the uh, remote control didn't light up. Well, it did light up but it lit up in the infrared color, so you could not see it with your eyes. Um, infrared is also the color that uh, we radiate because we are warm. So a lot of animals that 
um, or predators and chase uh, warm prey have eyes that can see in the infrared, which allows them to see their prey. If we go to even longer wavelengths, we have microwaves. And yes, it's the same microwaves as um, we use in microwave ovens. Now you might think, wait a minute, if microwave ovens have lower energy than visible light, why don't we just heat up our food with visible light? We could just take a flashlight, shine it on, on a, a cup of coffee and heat it up like that. Um, well, one of the reasons why we don't do that is because visible light has this tendency of bouncing uh, off the surface of objects and not penetrating the objects. Microwaves, instead, they penetrate in uh, the, the cup of soup or um, the lunch that you put in the microwave, and uh, they get absorbed by the, by the food molecules. So this is why we use a microwave instead of visible light, even if it has lower energy. And even longer wavelengths, the lowest ones we give a name to, the lowest energy ones are radio. And here I, I put a little picture of a radio, but um, it's not just old radio sets that use radio waves. Wi-Fi um, uses radio waves. Um, telephone, uh, cell phone, television, all the modern technology uh, relies on radio waves. Now, it's important to note that these categories, radio, microwave, infrared, uh, they are all, and also X-ray, gamma ray, they are all labels that we put on some wavelengths of the same thing. And these labels are the boundaries between each of these categories are changing depending on the um, application we, we make of them. For instance, in radio astronomy, we considered radio and microwave to be both radio. Sometimes we will specify this is a microwave telescope, but uh, they fall under the same um, category of radio astronomy. Okay, but now we talk about the size of wavelengths, but what are these sizes? Actually, are they like the size we see on the screen right, screen right now? Well, here's a little comparative uh, picture. So the size of the wavelengths for visible, visible light is about as uh, living cells or unicellular uh, organisms. Ultraviolet has roughly the size of a strand of DNA or uh, a molecule. X-ray has roughly the size of uh, an atom, and gamma ray has roughly the size of the nucleus of an atom. Now, on the other side, you have infrared, which has roughly the size of the tip of a needle. Microwave has the size of, I put a pencil here, but it's really uh, any everyday object. Microwave is the size of, uh, the microwaves has, have wavelengths of the size that is most easily conceivable by, by us. Um, can be a pencil, but also um, the length of, uh, of a tissue box or any other uh, everyday object has the, roughly the size of a microwave. And when you go uh, the size of a human being or larger, like a house or a building, we're talking about um, radio waves. Now this picture you have in front of you, this whole slide, is what we call the electromagnetic spectrum because it is a continuum of electromagnetic waves. But for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to call it the full rainbow. So it's the rainbow that includes all the colors. Um, the the take-home message of this slide is really that gamma ray, microwave, ultraviolet, these are all words that you've heard uh, at one point or another in your life. But you probably never associated, with, associated them with light. But I really want you to, to remember that they are all made of the same stuff. They are all light stuff. They just have different wavelengths. Now, how can we see the invisible part of this rainbow? For the short wavelengths or high energy, we use cameras. Well, I'm being a bit um, not very precise here because, as you all know, you cannot detect an X-ray with your phone camera. Otherwise, you would you would see it if you point your phone camera to something that generates X-rays. Um, so I'm going to put little brackets here. What I mean by camera is any device that behaves somewhat like a camera. And by that, I mean that the detection mechanism relies on the speck of light bouncing off a part of the detection apparatus and triggering some domino effect to a recording um, device like a, a hard drive. 
or a computer. So um, for our eyes, this mechanism ha happens in the retina, but uh, the camera has a photographic plate. Um, gamma rays is really different. Uh, often we use uh, scintillator blocks, which are sort of blocks that look like blocks of glass, but when a gamma ray goes through it and bounces off something, some molecule or some electron in that block of glass, it creates some uh, chain reaction that is detected. So this part uh, of the spectrum is detected by a speck of light bouncing off the detector. If we go at slightly longer wavelengths, we use temperature. We use uh, some form of thermometer that we will call bolometers. Bolometers are objects that you put where you think there is some uh, light coming in, some microwaves coming in, and you measure the temperature of the bolometer. If there is light coming on it, it should warm up and you should measure that change of temperature. And I think I can be pretty confident in saying that most of you have already performed a measurement like that. Let's uh, try to remember the last time you used a new microwave for the first time, new microwave oven for the first time. You put your cup of soup in it for one minute like you do with your good old microwave at home. And after a minute, you take it out and it's boiling hot. So your logical conclusion is next time, I'm going to put it a shorter amount of time, maybe 40 or 50 seconds. What you've just done now is checked the temperature of your bowl of soup and concluded that this microwave generates more, uh, more light, more microwaves. So this is exactly the same technique that we use uh, when we use a bolometer. But instead of using a cup of soup, we use um, an instrument that is way more precise. And lastly, for the long wavelengths, we use long wavelength detectors, which are antennas. They take uh, all shapes and forms. Um, you can think of the antenna that you see on the car, which is just, just a long, like meter long stick of metal. But also there is an antenna in your phone. It's very small. Um, there are very large antennas that you can see if you look uh, at uh, pretty much every major cities have antennas in the top of their buildings. You have all seen them. I'll get back to a uh, long wavelength detector in a second. But first, I want to talk a little bit about astronomy. When we do astronomy, we look at the sky. We don't want to look at this light coming from the sky. So visible light, you can start uh, stand in your backyard, look up at the sky, and see visible light. So from Earth, presumably your backyard is on Earth, you are able to see visible light, stars, uh, shooting stars, um, galaxies. Um, so visible light goes to Earth really easily. But um, X-rays and gamma rays get blocked by the atmosphere. Uh, so to detect X-rays and gamma rays, you have to go in space. You have to send um, your X-ray detector in space. Um, if you want to detect infrared and micro and very low, uh, very low uh, short wavelength microwave, basically the middle part of the band, you also need to go in space. Uh, sometimes what people do is they put their detector on balloons that go extremely high up in the atmosphere, or sometimes they just send their detector in orbit around the Earth. But at very long wavelengths, we're lucky enough that radio waves penetrate the atmosphere and are detectable from the surface of the Earth. And this is super convenient because, as you'll see, the radio detectors are huge. And if we wanted to put them on the rocket, uh, to send them in orbit, it will be it would be pretty much impossible. So we're very lucky to be able to do radio um, astronomy from the surface of Earth. Let's focus a little bit on these radio detectors. Um, long wavelength detectors uh, often look like the one you see on the top left. So a part of it is the dish. The dish is just uh, its only function is to reflect all the light coming in to a single point. That point is called the focus, and I'm going to show you what happens at focus. So at focus, you have the light coming in, and you want to bring in to bring it bring it into your computer to do some analysis. How do you bring it? How do you put that in the cable? Actually, you use a funnel. This might sound a bit silly, um, but no, I'm not um, pulling around. This is, it's really something like a funnel that we use, and it looks a lot. Uh, when I say a funnel, um, it really looks a lot like a funnel. Um, if you if you Google um, uh, 
radio detectors, you will see a lot of them look like funnels. And they behave like funnels too, because the wave is squeezed into the cable that goes all the way to the computer. The wave might change form a little bit when it goes uh, into the cable because it's a different medium. So it travels not through free space. It's squeezed into a little cable. But we, we, can, we know how much is distorted and we can reconstruct it on the computer. This is fundamentally different from the cameras that I told you about earlier. Because with the cameras, little specks of lights were bouncing off, if you remember. So if they're bouncing off, we, we know nothing about them except for the fact that at some point they arrived and at some point they left. But with these ones that we can squeeze in the cable, it means that we can actually see the shape of the wave on the computer. This is very useful because it means we are able to know exactly when each of the little peaks of this wave um, was detected. It allows us to use a technique called interferometry. Now, interferometry is a bit of an intimidating word, maybe. Um, and maybe one day I will do a separate talk just to talk about interferometry. Unfortunately, I will, I will not um, have time to explain it today. But um, what I want you to, to remember from interferometry that it's a, that it's a, it's that it's a technique um, that you can use in radio astronomy. Recently, they managed to do interferometry with uh, visible light also, but it's very hard. But you can do it uh, easily with radio astronomy. It allows you to achieve extremely high resolution. This means that the pictures you take are very, very precise. You see very small details. The kind of resolution you have is, um, let's say you're standing in your backyard, looking over at the sky and you see a plane flying. Well, if you had the same resolution as uh, the kind of interferometers that we build these days, you would be able to see if on that plane, there is a fruit fly, a little tiny fly uh, on, the, on the nose of the plane. So this is a kind of extremely high resolution that we can. Some of the pictures I'll show you later were taken using uh, interferometry. Now there's one last concept that I want to talk about because it's ubiquitous in radio astronomy. It's the Hertz, kilohertz, megahertz, gigahertz. You've probably already seen this symbol on the radio. Hertz really is just a different way to talk about wavelength. And to explain it, we're going to play a little game. So here we have two waves of different wavelengths. But one thing we know about light is that it always travels at the same speed. So we're going to play a little game where we're going to count the number of peaks that cross the finish line. So I'm going to make these waves move, um, and we're going to count the peaks. Uh, I want you all to count the peaks um, of the wave at the top, and I'll count the peaks of the wave at the bottom. Okay, three, two, one. Okay, so I counted five peaks, and I know this little animation lasted five seconds, so that's one peak per second. Now, I'm, I know that you probably didn't manage to count all the peaks that went up there. But I have a little technique to guess how many peaks cross the finish line for the, the wave at the top. You see the length of this wave here? Well, you see that the wavelength at the top is exactly five times uh, that length. So if I had one per second crossing the finish line at the bottom, there were probably five per second crossing the finish line at the top. I say probably, but I know it's exactly that because I designed this animation. And then uh, five per second, one per second, we just use a shortcut, which is to call it Hertz. So Hertz just means per second. And we call that frequency. So you see that by talking about the frequency, we give information about the wavelength. Um, so long as you know how fast a wave travels, if you know the frequency and how fast it travels, you know the wavelength and vice versa. And the light always travels at the same speed as the speed of light. So uh, sometimes people will talk about an observatory that uh, detects 300 megahertz, but what they mean is they detect light that has a wavelength of one meter. They just both mean the same thing. Okay, so this was uh, the theory of, of uh, radio astronomy. Now, if we go back to this picture and we show this, what we're really looking at in the first picture is only the visible light. It's what you would see with a traditional telescope uh, provided with strong enough. 
And this is what you would see if you had a radial telescope. Now, uh, since radio, we cannot see it with our eyes. We painted these radio waves in pink. Um, but um, this, is, this is the best we can do. Since we cannot see it with our eyes, we have to cheat. We have to give a color to the radio waves. So this is what we would see if our eyes could see the radio spectrum. Um, note that is, in this picture, we don't see the infrared. We don't see the gamma ray or the x-rays. This is just um, visible light and radio. Okay, you're going to see more pictures like that in a minute. But first, let's do a little history of radio astronomy. So the theory of the electromagnetic spectrum. The electromagnetic spectrum was theorized by James Clerk Maxwell, who you see on this picture here. And for, um, for every uh, landmark that I will present here, note that um, I'm presenting what, as it's presented in uh, mainstream Western um, uh, theory of, of physics, but as anything in science or in math, um, if it was discovered by someone else and not credited, um, this is something I, I, I didn't find. Uh, what all I'm presenting is, the, is what's as it's presented in the mainstream Western literature. So James Kirk Maxwell was a mathematician and physicist, and he predicted the electromagnetic spectrum as I presented at the beginning of this talk. But it took 35 years before anyone actually detected anything else than visible light. It was a scientist called Hertz, whose name you've seen a couple of slides ago, who uh, managed to produce and detect uh, radio waves. About the same time, uh, maybe 10 years later, uh, other physicists took a paradox similar to what Hertz used to detect his waves and pointed them at the sky, but they didn't detect anything. Uh, the, the, the problem at the time was that their apparatus was not sensitive. So this was the first attempt at radio astronomy. It didn't work. It took another 35 years before a scientist called Carl Jansky, who also gave his name to uh, a unit of measurement, uh, and I'm not, I'm not getting into that right now, he was an engineer at Bell Labs, um, the phone company, and he was tasked with trying to detect radio waves that could interfere with telephone communication. So he built this big antenna, uh, which you see a replica on the right. The antenna was built on Ford Model T wheels, so you could uh, turn it around and point it to different directions. And Jansky detected a periodic radio signal from the sky. Periodic means that it repeats uh, in a regular interval. In his case, he discovered it re repeated every three, 23 hours and 56 minutes. That's almost a full day, but that's actually what we call a sidereal day, which is the time it takes for the stars to, um, to rotate around the Earth and come back exactly at the same point. It's not exactly the same thing uh, as, um, as a solar day. And why we care that it's not the same thing um, is because Jansky was able to conclude that the radio signal he was detecting did not come from the sun, but it came from some star or some constellation. Um, he talked to uh, astronomer friends and looked at, at maps of the sky, and he discovered that it probably came from the constellation of Sagittarius, which is near the center of the Milky Way. Unfortunately, unfortunately Bell Labs uh, reassigned Jansky to some other task, and radio astronomy uh, stopped there um, in the 30s. Uh, little did he know, and spoiler alert, but what he was looking at was this picture. This is the center um, of the Milky Way in the radio spectrum. Once again, we had to put colors on the radio waves. Uh, we would not see that with our naked eyes. In the 1940s, uh, an amateur a radio technician and engineer called Grode Reaver did some radio astronomy in his backyard. Um, this sentence may sound underwhelming, but it's because it's really all the radio astronomy that was performed in the 40s. Now you can understand why in the 40s, maybe uh, engineers were busy with other stuff. Um, but uh, Reber did produce some early maps of the sky um, in the radio spectrum and published the first radio astronomy papers ever. Um, but it was uh, very um, modest beginnings. Then in the 50s, uh, up to present day, radio astronomy started being taken seriously by universities, research institutions. On the right, you see Parks Observatory, one of the uh, earliest um, uh, radio telescopes. 
So as you can see, radio astronomy is a very young field of research. It's, um, astronomy itself is uh, thousands of year old, years old, but um, radio astronomy, at least, at least as we do it uh, today, is only uh, about 70 years old. Now let's look at some landmark results so that you can understand how important radio astronomy is. First is this map of the Milky Way. Um, what you see on the right is um, the Milky Way, but it's not a picture. Because if we wanted to take a picture, well, we are inside the Milky Way. The Milky Way is this big, thick disk. And we cannot just take a camera and stick it on a very powerful telescope and take a picture of this because we'd see it sideways. We'd see the Milky Way edge on. If you wanted to see um, the Milky Way from a vantage point that, such as the one we see on the picture here, we would have to send our camera thousands of light years in one direction, have the camera take a picture, and then send the picture uh, thousands of light years uh, back to us. It would take uh, thousands of years um, for the picture to be taken. So this is an artist's rendition. But we're pretty confident that the Milky Way looks like that thanks to radio astronomy. The reason is that uh, the Milky Way is pretty thick and pretty opaque if we look at it with our naked eye. But if we look at it with radio telescopes, it's actually transparent. And as early as in the 50s, uh, physicists were able to map the Milky Way. So this on the right here, you see a very early map of the Milky Way. Yeah, the more, the more uh, modern ones are more precise and allow us to reconstruct the Milky Way as you saw in the previous picture. And it's thanks to the fact that the Milky Way is uh, somewhat transparent to radio waves that we can um, know exactly what it looks like. The second result that is of importance now, I'm, I'm going in chronological order, so um, it's not uh, an order of importance, but this one is still pretty important, is the measurement of the CMB, the Cosmic Microwave Background. It is such an important measurement that it will take just a minute to explain what the CMB is. So the Cosmic Microwave Background is, um, I'm, I'm going to take some steps to explain. So imagine you're on Earth and you're looking at the sky. If you look at um, the sun, and please don't look at the sun with a telescope, despite what the picture suggests, um, unless you know exactly what you're doing, um, the sun is 150 million kilometers away. So even if the light is very, the speed of light is very, very high, it will take some time before light from the sun reaches you. So if something happens in the sun, let's say, um, there's a, a, sun, a spot on the sun that appears or, or whatever could some, some uh, ship passes in front of the sun, it will take eight minutes for us to see it on Earth because uh, light takes eight minutes to travel that distance. Now, if we were to look at an object a bit further, like uh, the Big Dipper, which uh, the stars are roughly 100 light years away, um, well, whatever we see on the Big Dipper, the Big Dipper happened 100 years ago. Also means that if there was a little green man or woman standing uh, on the planet orbiting the Big Dipper, looking uh, at Earth, what they would see is the year 1920. And here, a note is that I switched from kilometers to light years, because one light year is 9.46 trillion kilometers. So it would be really cumbersome to just keep track of these numbers. Um, now we have a galaxy, which can be 10 million light years away. Uh, this means that when we look at the galaxy, the galaxy, um, uh, whatever is happening that we see happened 10 million light years ago, 10 million years ago. And if someone was in that galaxy looking at Earth, what they would see as the Earth 10 million years ago. But now, at these, in these years, in the 1960s, we didn't know if the universe started with a Big Bang or had always existed. But the theory of the Big Bang was catching on, becoming more and more popular. So we wanted to prove it. And we thought, well, if there was a Big Bang, we should be able to look far enough that we look in the past at a time when the universe was just after the Big Bang. We should be able to look at the Big Bang. Unfortunately, um, just after the Big Bang, the universe was very, very, very dense. And we were not able to see through it. So if we look uh, roughly 13.8 billion light years away, 
what we see is a wall. But this, this wall has a little glow. And we can actually measure that glow with microwave detectors. Um, at that time, detecting that glow would be a very strong proof um, of the existence of the Big Bang. We didn't know how big the universe was, but we knew that if the Big Bang uh, was a, a possible theory, there should be a wall at some point in the back of the universe. The theorists had made predictions on what wavelength should that uh, wall produce. Now, Penzias and Wilson were two engineers, once again working for the same telephone company, Bell Labs. And they, they had this big uh, radio telescope that you see on the right. Uh, this is one of them that really looked like a funnel. And this telescope was um, decommissioned. It was used for uh, telecommunication initially, but eventually it became decommissioned. So Penzias and Wilson, who were engineers, but also physicists, uh, they said, hey, uh, Bell Labs, do you mind if we go use this old telescope that you're not using anymore? So they just took it, pointed it to the sky, and predicted and, and measured the predicted uh, cosmic microwave background, the wall at the back of the universe. And I will show you another measurement of the CMB in a minute, but I uh, just wanted to present this important piece of theory. Um, another important discovery was the discovery of quasars. On the right, you have the Lovell telescope. Uh, if you've ever been to Manchester, UK, you can see that telescope from some places downtown. It's huge although the telescope is a bit uh, off the countryside. Uh, quasars are extremely bright objects that are very, very far that we cannot see uh, in the visible light. Not so much because uh, they don't emit in the visible light, but the quantity of visible light they emit is too small for their distance. It's too faint for how far they are. But they emit very strongly in the radio um, part of the spectrum. So with radio telescopes, we can detect quasars. And using, using some techniques, we're able to determine how far they were. And they were further than we actually thought uh, how, how big the universe was. They were not as far as the CMB, of course. But uh, remember, when we detected the CMB, um, we were not able to determine how far it was. We were just able to determine that there was a wall at the back. But quasars here were further than we thought uh, the size of the universe was. This is a bit like when on Earth we discover a rock and we do uh, carbon dating on the rock or, or some other form of dating on the rock and we determine that the rock is older than we thought the Earth was. So this is what happened with quasars. We learned about the size of the universe uh, thanks to radio telescopes. And there was a discovery of pulsars. Pulsars are uh, stars, that are stars that have a strong magnetic field and that are rotating very fast. What that means, it means that if we look at them with radio eyes, with radio telescopes, they look like lighthouses. Basically, they point to us and then stop pointing towards us and then point back towards us. They're very precisely timed, and we can use them to uh, test the general, the theory of general relativity by Einstein. I don't want to go in the weeds of general relativity. I would get confused myself. Uh, it's very intricate, but it affects how we experience space and time. And the fact that the pulsars are very precisely timed uh, allows us to test the general relativity to check whether it's correct. And so far, it is indeed correct. Uh, pulsars were discovered by Jocelyn Bell, who was a PhD student in 1967 when it, they were discovered. Uh, 10 years later, the Nobel Prize was awarded for the discovery of pulsars, but it was awarded to her supervisor, um, even though she made the discovery. And uh, unfortunately, this is something that happened a couple of times in the history of astronomy and science in general, uh, that either a woman or a student uh, was erased from, from recognition. So I want to correct the record. Uh, pulsars were discovered by uh, Justin Bell, who is still alive, by the way. Now let's come back to the CMB. As I told you, the CMB is this wall at the back of the universe. But this wall is not completely uniform. It has tiny fluctuations. And to do cosmology, the science of the history of the universe, um, it is very useful to know what these fluctuations look like. So in the early 90s, uh, um, NASA, deci NASA decided to send a satellite to map the CMB. And this is the picture they got. It looks a bit like a picture, uh, sometimes we would see a map of the Earth. It's the same projection, the sort of 
uh, oval size uh, shape. Uh, because this is how it looks when we project this here uh, on a flat surface. But this is actually the what if if you were to look at the sky in your um, and it remove all the stars, all the galaxies, and your let's say your eyes could see radio waves. This is what the sky would look like. This result was so important and so useful to cosmologists that NASA said, "Let's do it again, but with a more precise instrument." So ten to fifteen years later, they sent another spacecraft called WMAP, and they, they got this map of the CMB, more precise. And even after that, the European Space Agency wanted to be even more precise and sent a satellite called Planck, and got this map that you see here. And uh, here is the comparison of the three maps, the increase in resolution. So you can, you can see if every um, 10 years and the last 30 years, uh, major space agencies sent uh, uh, satellites that cost uh, enormous amounts of money to, to build and to send out how important this result is. OK, now let's look at not notable observatories. Uh, this is maybe the most famous observatory called a Very Large Array. I know we're not very original in the way we name our telescopes. So this, uh, this is an array. This is multiple telescopes. And this suggests when there are multiple telescopes, it suggests that they use the technique of interferometry, which are, I alluded to earlier in the presentation. Uh, interferometry combines the light from multiple telescopes. So this uh, telescope uses uh, interferometry to get very precise pictures of the sky. A lot of the pictures that I'm going to show come from this telescope. But it's also famous because it's been uh, used in many science fiction movies as this um, uh, base for the government agency or stuff like that. I think in one of the Terminator movies, it was used. So yes, there are 28 antennas, but only 27 of them work uh, at the same time. Not because one is broken, but because they do a rotation uh, where they, main they do maintenance on the 28 antenna. And they are 25 meters in time here. This is huge. To give you an idea, uh, optical, optical telescopes, uh, we're, we're currently working when I say optical, I mean traditional visible light telescopes. They're currently working on building a 30 meter telescope. And it's a very, and here in the 80s, uh, they were already building dozens of 25 meter radio telescopes. The reason for that is that since radio astronomy works with longer wavelengths, the telescope don't need to be as precise. The surface doesn't need to be very, very smooth. So they are easy, easier to build and easier to, to maintain. Another famous telescope is a Green Peng telescope. It's the largest fully steerable radio telescope. So it's the uh, largest telescope that you can point uh, basically in any direction except towards the ground. Um, the Green Peng telescope is 100 meters in diameter. But sorry, it didn't always look like this. Um, initially, this one was built in 2001. Initially, uh, it looked like this. This one was built in 1961, one of the earliest telescopes was 90 meters in diameter, just a bit smaller. This picture here was taken in uh, some day in 1998. And this is what uh, the telescope looked that day. And this is what it looked like the very next day. Unfortunately, the structure was not solid enough to maintain it any longer, and it collapsed. Uh, the telescope was not rebuilt for another 12 years when it eventually looked like this. And this one still stands, thankfully. Um, like I said, radio telescopes don't need to be as precise as traditional visible light telescopes. But this one, despite being 100 meter in diameter, is still uh, smooth and to a preci precision of a quarter of a millimeter, which is roughly a five human hair thick. The next telescope I want to show is the Arecibo Observatory in Puerto Rico. It was completed in 1963, but it's still producing very important science. It's 300 meters in diameter, and it has no moving parts. So if it wants to look at different places in the sky, it has to wait for the, the Earth to rotate. Another telescope that's very similar to that one is the FAST telescope, which is 500 meters in diameter, even bigger. The FAST observatory for 500 aperture uh, space telescope, 500 meter aperture space telescope, um, does have movable parts. 
the dish itself is composed of little panels that can rotate in one direction or another, which allows the dish to point different directions, but it's not fully steerable. It can just move about a little bit. I have a very poor picture because uh, often a radio telescope, this one is very recent. And uh, when, when radio telescopes are working, we don't want to bring helicopter and, um, and drones around because they produce radio waves that will interfere with the signal. So this one was taken, uh, this is still from a video, I think just after the construction, but there are very few professional pictures. And this last one is a personal favorite because I'm working on it. Well, I'm working on an extension of it. It's called CHIME, the Canadian Hydrogen Intensity Mapping Experiment. And to explain what CHIME does, um, it, it detects pulsars and other sort of radio sources in the sky. But also, um, if you recall the map of the Milky Way that I showed earlier, um, CHIME is trying to do that, but instead of mapping just the Milky Way, it's trying to map the whole universe using exactly the same technique. It's tricky, it's, it's hard, um, but um, this is the kind of science that CHIME is, is trying to do. Uh, CHIME, can see the whole sky, every, the whole not northern sky, basically the sky over the North Hemisphere every day, because it sees uh, at any given moment, it sees any point in the sky along a line that goes from the equator to the North Pole, and it sort of scans with the rotation of the Earth. It has no uh, moving part. And for the last part, I'm gonna show you some pictures, uh, pictures that were produced thanks to radio astronomy. So this, uh, I've already showed you, is the center of the Milky Way using uh, radio telescopes. I think this one was, um, oh yeah, it was used Meerkat Telescope, um, which is in South Africa. And here, just to give you an idea, um, the, at the center of the Milky Way, there is a black hole. The famous picture of the black hole that you maybe saw last year uh, was uh, is um, exactly in that picture. Um, it's not, it, the, the same black hole is there, but the same picture I'll show you later. Um, it's, it's the spot that's slightly to the right of the middle is the black hole of, at the center of the Milky Way. Here is exactly the same thing, uh, the center of the Milky Way, in every part of the spectrum except the radio part. So in the red, you have infrared. In yellow, you have all the visible light is painted yellow. And um, in blue, you have uh, everything that's higher energy than, um, than visible light. And in that case, the, the um, black hole at the center uh, is slightly shifted here. It's uh, a bit to the bottom right. You see a twirl in the blue. This is the black hole at the center of the Milky Way. And I want to present to you uh, this picture. This is the picture of the black hole that came out uh, last year. And this uh, picture was um, possible thanks to the technique of interferometry, which was developed at uh, radio test. So, um, so landmark discoveries are, are performed thanks to uh, radio astronomy to this day. Here is once again the center of the Milky Way. This time I included um, only radio and X-ray. So um, in, in red is radio and uh, X-ray, diff different ener uh, energy of X-rays are in green and blue. Okay, now this picture, is, you've already seen it, but now that you understand it better, um, I'm showing it to you again. I'm gonna give you another example of exactly the same phenomenon. This is the galaxy Centaurus A uh, in the visible range. So it's really hard to see. There's this big cloud in front of it. But if we include radio uh, and X-ray, so radio uh, is in red, is in orange and red, and X-ray is in blue. It's typically a convention. X-ray, since it's higher energy, and blue has higher, higher energy than red. We present X-ray in blue and radio uh, typically in red. So this is exactly the same picture, uh, but adding radio and X-ray. Then you have the Crab Nebula. So this is how you would see the Crab Nebula with a, a traditional visible light telescope. The Crab Nebula is, an, is a star that exploded a thousand years ago, and this is what it looks like now. And here, thanks to uh, NASA and the European Space Agencies and some uh, scientists working there, they produced pictures of the Crab Nebula at all the different uh, ranges of the electromagnetic spectrum. So to the left, you see all uh, the different pictures superposed, but on the bottom, you see them uh, separately. So radio and red, infrared and greenish yellow. In green, you have optical, 
uh, ultraviolet uh, and blue, and then in, in violet, you have x-ray. So the sky would be really different if we could see all these colors. Here's exactly the same thing, but as an animation, if you want to see them move about, you can find this animation online if you, if you look up uh, Crab Nebula GIF. And I'm going to leave you with this picture, which is Cygnus A, another galaxy. Uh, now I just show you the radio and X-ray. Uh, I didn't find a picture of Cygnus A invisible, only uh, at the same scale to compare. But I just like this picture, uh, so I wanted to, to leave you with this. There's a little summary now. So the summary at the beginning is radio waves, microwaves, X-rays, gamma rays are just like visible light. They're the same thing but with different wavelengths. Radio astronomy is still a very recent field of research uh, as proven by the, the maps of the CMB that are still being produced and uh, the, the, the picture of that black hole that was released last year and a lot of results are still coming out every week. We can do radio astronomy from the ground, which is great. You don't have to go in space to do radio astronomy. And we can do it at extremely high resolution very high detail thanks to interferometry. And radio astronomy allows us to push the literal boundaries of astrophysics. When I say literal boundaries, I'm talking about distances. The furthest objects we've seen in the sky have been detected thanks to radio astronomy. The limit of what we can see in the sky uh, can only be seen using radio astronomy. Thank you. That's, that's all for me. I'm going to open up the floor for questions now. Ooh, amazing. That was that was great. I mean, I enjoyed watching it even once again. Um, we have some really great questions in the chat. So we'll just uh, go through here. And and as we're answering, you know, questions, if there's something that you're dying to ask Vincent, please don't be shy. Just pop a pop a question in the chat and we'll do our best to get to it. Um, so oops, let me just here. Richard is asking, what are we seeing when we look at the Planck image of the cosmic microwave background? Like, what is that exactly? Yeah, okay, I'm gonna go back to, uh, to that image so we know what we're talking about. Amazing, yes. In case um, anyone missed it, yeah. Sorry, it's a bit far back, but... No it's worries. Worth, it's worth rewinding. For sure. Okay, so the cosmic microwave background, um, what we like to, how we, I like to describe it is the wall at the back of the universe. So if you remove all the stars, all the galaxies, and uh, you look with radio instruments, this is what you see. But what you see there is remnants from the Big Bang. So this happened, uh, with this image, you can only see um, what happened 300,000 years after the Big Bang. It may, this may sound like a long time, 300,000 years, but it's actually short on this cosmic scale. So just after the Big Bang happened, the universe was very small and very dense, and you could not, no life was, was escaping from there. And after 300,000 years, it became diffuse enough that light could escape and reach uh, and travel throughout the sky, and we see it uh, to this day. So what we see there is the first light that escaped after the Big Bang. And the spots that are red and the spots that are blue uh, are what we call the fluctuations from the CMB. And there are still different models that explain um, how they emerged. But the most mainstream one that, that I know, um, and I, I think it's probably a valid one, is that just at the beginning of the Big Bang, um, in a period called inflation, when the universe was basically, I don't want to say exploding, but expanding very rapidly, there were tiny fluctuation, fluctuations, quantum fluctuations that were happening kind of randomly, and the inflation blew them up uh, into these uh, little fluctuations that you see there. So these are sort of random fluctuations at a tiny, tiny scale that were blew up during the Big Bang. Um, and, and eventually these fluctuations uh, aggregated to form galaxies and stars and the first uh, objects. Wow, that's wild. That's, that's amazing. Yeah. Um, somebody was asking, and it, it was very on in the talk, so I think when you're kind of going through the different, um, you know, types of, of 
electromagnetics. Um, do neutrinos play any part in kind of radio astronomy or? Yeah, um, so neutrinos are often, they're also of interest for uh, astronomers because often when uh, we look at some event in the sky that we detect uh, with radio telescopes, then we're gonna also use neutrino detectors to see how oh, this object sends out radio waves. Does it also send mm -hmm. out neutrinos? Yeah. Uh, but neutrinos are not part of the electromagnetic spectrum. They are, they are particles, they are very, very small, but they are not, um, they are not like light. Uh, X-rays are like light, radio waves are like light, but neutrinos are different kind of particles that unfortunately I don't feel confident explaining precisely what they are, but they are a different kind of, kind of particle the same way electrons are a different kind of particle. But uh, yeah, they're very, in astronomy, they're very important. Also, uh, actually, okay. actually uh, if yes. I can add something, since we just talked yes. about the CMB. For sure. of, please we, we do, just if you want to share your screen, yeah, and I, I, I took your screen mm. sharing off, but if you want to no. share your screen anytime, please feel free. Just, I, just, uh, I didn't I want just, it to be posted stamp sized anymore <laughs> when we were chatting. No, sure. Uh, it's just, since someone brought up the neutrinos and just after I talked about the CMB, so the yeah. CMB, like I said, is the earliest light that we can see, but uh, it might be possible to see something that is not light that came from before uh, the CMB. Uh, for instance, neutrinos, and we would call we call them primordial neutrinos. And some astronomers are trying to detect neutrinos that are even older than the CMB. So right now, the furthest limit that we can see in the sky is thanks to radio astronomy, but maybe eventually that limit will be pushed back thanks to neutrino astronomers. That's cool. No, no, yeah, I love that. Um, so um, Isabella is asking, just for clarification, so the shorter the wavelengths with high energy, does that mean they are always smaller in size? Uh, yes, when, when you have wavelengths that are smaller, you have higher energy. You cannot have a high energy light at low wavelength. So they really go in, in opposite direction. You increase ah, okay. the wavelength, you decrease the energy. That's how okay, it is. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. So it's yeah, good, good question. Okay. Yeah. easy to remember. And there's no, yeah, <laughs> yeah. there are no exceptions. I was wondering yeah. the same. Yeah. Um, somebody, there was a great question about, um, about color. And I was really interested uh, if there was an answer for this one. Zach asks, is there a specific system for assigning colors to non-visible lights? Um, yeah, well, there's a convention, but it's not set in stone. But typically, mm -hmm. since um, color blue and violet have a higher energy than color uh, red and orange, that has low energy, typically what we do is we do the same for the whole spectrum. So when we want to see, uh, show invisible colors that I, are of high energy, like X-ray or gamma ray, we will use blue and violet. When, when, when we want to see low energy like a microwave or radio waves, we, we will use red and orange. So it's a convention that's useful. You can imagine it as, as sort of stretching the rainbow uh, over the whole spectrum, if, if that makes sense to you. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, this is it's a convention. It's not a rule set in stone, but it's typically what people do, yes. Cool. No, that I was. I'm always curious. I find the color fascinating, and it, this yeah. talk taught me a lot about colors. So that's <laughs> that's awesome. Um, so somebody's asking. They're just curious. How do you get actually a 2D image from just a single radio wave, or are we missing something? Here? Yeah, that, um, it's an excellent question. I, I, I did <laughs> ask that uh, a couple of times. Um, it's it's very hard. So uh, <laughs> when you have a um, a radio telescope, that telescope has a resolution. And the resolution, basically what it means is the size that it's looking at in the sky. So maybe its resolution will be the size of the moon. Maybe it would be a bit smaller, a bit larger. And if you want to see all the whole 2D picture, you have to look at one point in the sky, then move the telescope, look at another point, move the telescope, look at another point. So it takes a very long time uh, to make these 2D pictures. Um, there, there's a way to look at them faster, look at the sky faster by using multiple telescopes and using uh, the, the technique of interferometry, which I don't want to go into details, but uses the delay between the time of arrival of the light to create multiple pictures at the same time 
uh, and create a 2D picture very quickly. But essentially, the technique uh, boils down to pointing at different places of the sky and stitching all the pictures together. That's cool. No, that that like something you boggle your mind staying up like late at night. Like, how do they do that? How do these? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that, yeah. Good question. Yeah, that was a great question, Paul. Thank you for asking that. Um, um, a question: um, Can you build a space-based radio telescope? Does that work, or do they always have to be on the ground where we are? Uh, once again, good question. Uh, we can build them in the space. In space, um, the issue if you Maybe if I can go to these observatories, if you look at these ones at 25 meters in diameter, 100 meters in diameter, they're yeah. enormous. So if we wanted to build them in the sky, it would be hard. But building them in the sky has some uh, advantage, uh, advantages. For instance, uh, when you're on Earth, you have a lot of interference from uh, cell phones and television stations. So it's very hard to make some detections. So um, some radio telescopes um, there are some projects right now to, um, I, I know one, don't know if it's ever going to be built, but I heard of one, placing one on the dark side of the moon. So there's a part of the moon that never points toward the earth, always pointing on the other side. So putting a very small antenna there would be completely shielded from anything happening on earth. So, um, that would uh, give us a very good uh, vantage point on the universe. But right now, uh, most of the radio astronomy is done on earth. But yeah, there's, there's, there's no reason, especially since, once again, I mentioned interferometry. Uh, one, uh, of the, uh, one of the tricks that we use with inter interferometry is to put two telescopes very far away, and they act as a single telescope that's as large as the distance between the two telescopes. So uh, if we put a telescope in uh, Toronto, where I am, and a telescope in, on the West Coast in Vancouver, and we combine their light, it acts with as much resolution as a telescope that had diameter uh, as huge as the distance between Toronto and Vancouver. So wow. then someone could say, okay, well, what if we put a radio telescope on Earth and one on Jupiter or one uh, on Pluto very, very far, then we would have an incredible resolution. So this is mm -hmm. um, one reason why we would want to put uh, uh, radio telescopes in space. Also. Ah, okay. Excellent. I, I actually thought of they could only be on ground. So that's, yeah, <laughs> that's no, it's possible. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> so somebody, and you did uh, mention interferometry in your, um, in your answer to this question, but somebody was asking kind of when was the earliest instances of kind of people starting to use interferometry? Like, do we know, is there a specific person who was the first or kind of when? I know it's very recent in terms of, but was it like 1900s or earlier? Yeah. Or? The trick is that interferometry is a technique that is not unique to radio astronomy. It's a technique mm -hmm. that's used uh, in physics in general. Um, we use it uh, on um, the earliest instance I, I know, but it's probably not the earliest one that was uh, used is the uh, um, two physicists called Mikkel Mickelson and Morley. And they wanted to, uh, so if you look up Mickelson, Morley interferometry, as far as I know, is the oldest one. They wanted to know whether uh, there was some sort of suspense, substance that permeated space. They called it ether. And they, they built an interferometer in their lab that was sort of um, installed on some, I don't remember, some device that they could re rotate it. So I don't want to go into details partly as, you can, as you're seeing because I don't remember it very well. But I think this was at the turn of the, of the 20th century, so early 1900s or late 1800s. Um, and uh, interferometers are used for the detections of uh, gravitational waves. If you heard of uh, LIGO, the detections of uh, gravitational waves, I think in 2016 or 2017, um, were performed with an interferometer for gravitational waves instead of uh, electromagnetic waves. Um, so, yeah, I'm sorry, I cannot tell when it started, but um, mm -hmm. it, it, in radio astronomy, we've, uh, we're, we're using it a lot now. Um, more and more, but I think it's pretty much always been there. I'm sorry, I don't know when the first radio yeah, no worries. No, it, that, that's a big question, especially because it, yeah. it can apply to any any instance in physics. Um, yeah. And I will just do a plug if, if people are more interested in, in gravitational waves, et cetera, we do have a couple of past talks um, archived on our YouTube channel 
um, with gravitational waves that you might want to check out too if that's if that's something that you are interested in learning more about. So I'm just checking it looks like just give people a couple more seconds. It looks like we have no further questions this evening. Um, we I, we had great questions this evening. Um, yeah. So what I will do is I'll plug um, I'll plug. We'll be here again next Tuesday evening, and there's a there's a talk titled Cosmic Dawn, and it's going to look at the period after kind of the Big Bang, how different the universe looked in comparison to how we see it. Um, and, and talk about, you know, new stars forming, et cetera. Um, it, so it sounds like it's going to be super exciting. Uh, my colleague, Mike Reed, will be hosting you all. Um, this Friday, um, I believe, we will have a new episode of A Picture in a Thousand Words, also on our YouTube channel, um, hosted by one of our um, other amazing astronomers, uh, Dr. Mubdi Rahman. He'll take you through some iconic space images. A lot of people commenting they love the imagery in tonight's presentation. So if you love space images, love kind of learning the breakdown of them, why they get their colors, et cetera, definitely uh, you'll want to check that out. And um, I'm just looking. Yep, yeah, I think we you've answered everything. Now everyone is an expert. <laughs> right. <laughs> so they're an That's expert. That's what I wanted. They're, they're, exactly yeah, exactly. What I wanted. <laughs> exactly. So I we with that we have no other questions. So I want to thank you so much for coming on and giving your giving your amazing talk. Well, thank you. Thank you for hosting me, Kara, and thank oh, uh, no everyone worries. for attending. Thank you everyone for uh, watching us and uh, we hope to see you soon and have a great night. Bye. Cool, we're off now. Great. I was like, cool.